Three, two, one. Welcome to the David the Dog Trainer Podcast, episode 107. Today we're being joined by Megan of Co op Canine Training. Let's get her on. everything's working here hello can you hear me sure can can you see me hang on hang on i'm making sure all our sound sounds soundy here no i cannot hear you or no sorry i can't hear you i cannot see you okay hold on all right let me see oh there we go we see ya all right do you need me to turn my camera the other way no 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 no. it's perfect okay cool what's happening not much, you know, just got some dogs on the treadmill, dogs on place, dogs in the crate, ready to go. You got dogs doing all that right now? Yeah. Dang. Yeah, show put, put it on the cam here. We got to show what uh what real I don't talk- have I don't have all that I don't have many cameras, angles, oh, you know. Man. My dog, I've got one <laughs> in this room behind me on yeah. place and then one right here, one right there, two in the crate and one on the treadmill. I so. love that. All my base is covered. Yeah. So you do all of this out of your house, right? Yes. That's unfortunately. So cool. I, yeah. It's <laughs> it is one of those like uh, like uh, 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 it's great, but it's horrible at the same time, right? Because like you could do things like what you're doing right now, which is take advantage of all of these real life situations to work on, but it's like you never escape it. <laughs> yeah. Like you can't clock out. Yeah. You for can't sure. Clock out. Hell yeah. yeah. Well, listen, I'm really happy that you uh, you're able to join us. This is Josh, my Hi, podcast. Sorry about here. last week. I lost power. Oh, you're fine. No problem. <laughs> I, You know, what's funny is I literally lost power, I think, two days ago for the first time in like the over two years that I've been in this house. It's so <laughs> weird. <clears throat> See, yeah, I get this. I mean, we lose. I don't want to say we lose power often, but if it's like overly windy or like, you know, snow yeah. or heavy rain. We usually lose power. The weird thing is we had like zero inclement weather that was like affecting it. <laughs> and, and I get like all excited sometimes when you lose power because it's like you get to pull out all the cool flashlights and stuff that you have sitting around the house <laughs> for emergencies that you get to use like once every two years. So <laughs> that was fun. But, you know, uh, yeah. awesome. Well, listen, uh, so you're in West Virginia right now, right? Um, No, I'm actually in North Carolina. North Carolina. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was born in West Virginia. That was it. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. And then raised in Ohio, Columbus right. area. What part of Columbus? And then were you I've in? been in Carolina about ten years now. What part of Columbus were you in? Uh, Westerville. Nice. Hmm. Hell yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, uh, why don't you go ahead and just uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, and we'll kind of start jumping into some topics here. Okay. Well. I am Megan Cunningham, and I am on year four of running my own business, Co-op Canine Training, here in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, I have been in the dog training industry for just under 10 years, so I think this is year nine. Um, And I got into it like most people. I feel like I had a dog that was more than what I knew how to handle. And, you know, I could do all of the basics, but he had severe separation anxiety in the crate and was like, damn near trying to kill himself to get out. And I was like, okay, I don't know how to do this. I don't know. This is more than I, you know, agreed to take on. Um, and my, I lived in an apartment at the time and they were like, Hey, um, all of your neighbors are complaining. And it sounds like your dog's like, being murdered um you might want to go home and check on that and you're gonna have to figure this out or we're gonna have to kick you out and I was like cool 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 cool. um and you know sure enough I set up a camera did all of those like trial scenarios acting like I was leaving and he literally would squeeze out of the corner of the crate and get his massive head stuck and then just like start thrashing and I'd come home to like pee poop vomit blood like everything you could think of and he'd be out of the crate and just like, hey, what's up? And I'm just like, oh, my gosh. So that's how I came across e-collars was that was really the only thing that helped him. Like, it didn't matter how much training we did in and out of the crate yeah. or how much we did positive stuff in the crate. He, if, if I closed that door and left, it was on. And the e-collar was the only thing that really helped him. Yeah. And so, unfortunately, I was introduced to it, you know, 10 years ago. In we only use it in a correctional type of way. Sure. Um, and then I quickly learned within the next couple of years that it could be used a completely different way. Sure. Which of course opened a bunch of doors. Um, 
So actually the, the person that I was introduced to it by was another local trainer at the time. And I was doing like dog sitting, dog walking. Um, and he was going out of town and asked if I could watch his dogs. Um, and then that kind of just cracked into the door of him kind of helping me with my dog. And he was like, Hey, you're, you're kind of a natural at this. You're like really good at this. Do you enjoy training dogs? And I was like, yeah, like I've always liked dogs. I've always had dogs around since I was a kid. Um, and so I just kind of started shadowing him and working alongside him. And then we dated for a few years and then I ended up going and working for another training company in Winston-Salem, which is about 45 minutes from Greensboro. Yep. Um, and I worked for them for three, three and a half years. And although I did learn a good amount and was exposed to a lot of different dogs and was able to work with a lot of different people and dogs, I learned more what not to do than sure. what to do, I would say mm-hmm. there, um, especially the business side of things. And so this is now probably four or five years into the training process. I was like, I got to get out of here. Like, I do not agree with what these people are doing. Sure. I am not, I'm not interested in working for them anymore. And so I left and it took a few months to kind of figure out if I was really going to pull the trigger on running my own business. So I went to a few different seminars, started kind of building a website and, you know, by 2019, I launched right before uh, the holidays mm-hmm. and then 2020 COVID happened. And yep. I was like, all right, how's this all about to go down? And I'm over here panicking, thinking like, I'm going to fail. This is like, you know, everything's closed down. There's no way I'm going to get work. And it was the exact opposite. And yeah. it hasn't stopped since. <laughs> yeah, we've all seen that is just I mean, it, the obviously the pet industry exploded around then, like same deal. Like we had I, I remember those first two weeks when everything kind of closed. We we're like, oh, fuck, what are we going to do this that right. And it was just like nonstop people reaching out to us. And it's funny, I everybody always asked me they're like, Oh, is it you know, COVID dogs? Is it puppies? Is it this? Is it that? And I always tell everybody it's just I think people because they couldn't escape their dog. were just realizing how psychotic they actually were. Yeah. Yes. Like, yes. That was it. They're like, I'm, I'm now home with my dog 24 seven. And I realized they're freaking assholes. Yeah, like 100%. <laughs> I have zero control. Please help. Yeah. Awesome. Well, listen, I mean, I, I already have like, just based on your little introduction, like so many good segues we can kind of go into with stuff. So one thing that I think is interesting. So you worked for two different people, basically, right? So the guy that you uh, originally found out about that helped you with your dog, obviously, and then the other training company and you mentioned, right? <clears throat> obviously, unfortunately, you didn't necessarily learn what to do. You learned what not to do. And I think that's a common trait in the dog industry that I see with like younger trainers that work with other trainers or work for other trainers is they usually say that same thing. And I think it just goes to show like so many trainers have such a lack of like business skills, like in this industry <laughs> and like client communication and understanding how to handle problems and uh, ethically run businesses and this and that, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm always curious, like as a business owner that has trainers working for me that I don't want to see them go elsewhere, right? I don't want to see them, you know, I want to see them, you know, chase their dreams, but I don't necessarily <laughs> want them to leave and go, you know, chase their dreams. What do you think is some of the common things you've seen as far as like limiting opportunities for you as somebody that was working for trainers that really pushed you away and how people can strive to do better for their trainers that are working for them. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because I had a girl that worked for me for two years and she just left before Christmas Yeah, and with, you know, like a whole five minute warning. Yeah. yeah. Um, (laughs) and it was like, i You know, in my head, when I hired her, I knew at some point, you know, she's younger. She just turned 22. And in my head, at some point, I knew we would inevitably go our separate ways. But I thought it would be the supportive. We've, (laughs) you know, I've got you, you've got me, and we're not going to burn bridges and all of that, you know. Because I did kind of, like you said, I want to see her grow. I want to see her flourish and and all of that. But unfortunately, that's not the route that she chose. And I can't do anything about it. And it is what it is. Um, It's definitely been a learning experience for sure. But back to your question, I would say, in particular, the company I was working for in Winston, my first year with them was relatively good. 
Um, the trainer that I was working under and the owner of our location, we all got along really well. We all kind of were on the same page. Um, and then unfortunately, a year into that, she had sold our location to this new couple gotcha. that had their dog trained by that company, but mm -hmm. they didn't know what the hell they were doing. Uh, so yeah, like, yeah. we're over here as the trainers, knowing what to say to the clients, yeah. how to approach a situation based on what they're giving us in terms of like, if the dog's reactive, separation anxiety needs, you know, potty training, all of these different things. Whereas they're the ones taking the calls and pitching the sales, but they don't know what the fuck they're talking. Ah, uh, That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so I'm like, you're probably blowing half of these calls because you don't even know <laughs> sure. what to talk about because they would come to us and say, well, our dogs were trained by so-and-so a couple years ago, but they've really regressed. And like, can you help us? And like, we'll retrain the dogs watching you train the new clients. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why are you owning this business? Yeah. And so that was my first kind of red flag. I was like, shit, like yeah, they yeah. don't even know how to work with their dogs, let alone work with other dogs with issues that they don't even have in their dogs. Like, sure, sure. how is this even working? And it's just because they had the money to buy the business. That's yeah, all it yeah, was. Yeah. It's all about money. And so that was my first like red flag. Well, then it turned into someone in the franchise in a completely different location. You know, there was a abuse case and a dog died. And so that just ripples into all of the different franchise places. Yes. And so all of these new protocols mm -hmm. are put into place yeah. that are, in my opinion, just unattainable yeah. for mm -hmm. yeah. some of the the dogs that we're working with. It's like over the top ability. trying to like cover their ass with stuff, but like Basically, putting in place these limitations. But putting it all on us. Yeah, that makes sense. And it, it, I was just like, and so we had to come in and like sign all these forms and go through all these like trainings for these new protocols. Sure. And I was like, we were all looking at each other like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. And sense. it's not sustainable either. And so that was kind of where I really started kind of backing out slowly. And like, they were just stacking dogs and dogs and dogs on top of me because at the time, I, I wasn't doing anything else. So that was my full-time job. I, I had the availability and the flexibility to take on a lot of dogs because I didn't have to do private lessons. I didn't have to do the business side of things. I was just training the board and train dogs. Yeah. So they'd stack me up with, you know, four or five dogs at a time. And I'm like, this is too much sure. because most of the dogs coming in have some pretty <clears throat> severe issues. And then of course it was one of those programs where it's, any dog, any age, any size, any issue, two weeks, we got it covered <laughs> off leash for liability. And I'm like, that is not realistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just not realistic. So the term we came up with for them, and I don't I don't drop their name for a purpose, but we 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 deemed them the fry to comply company. Yeah. That's how they use the e-collars. Sure, sure. Dog had no understanding of leash pressure. Dogs had no understanding of, of spatial pressure, but we're just slapping an e-collar on them anyway and yeah. frying them until they figure it out. And I was, I just couldn't get with it because yeah. these dogs were like, don't get me wrong. You come across a dog every so often that somehow handled it fine. Yeah. But most dogs are just shutting down and, you know, the owners are like just as confused as the dog. Yeah. And so I started kind of just doing my own thing and, and looking for other trainers that I really kind of agreed with. And I started, you know, talking to them, following them, going to their seminars, just all kind of like under the radar. And then I, I eventually got to the point where me and me and my boss, the, the owner of the company here and I just butt heads so bad. And I told her, I was like, I'm, I'm done. Like yeah. I'm looking for other jobs. I can't do this anymore. I can't work for you guys. Like it's just, it's, I can't do it. And so she was like, you know, that's fine. We don't want you here anyway. If you don't want to be here, da, 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 you know, yeah, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. peace. And so <laughs> I, yeah, I took a few months to figure it out. And I, I knew it was going to be hard, but it was so worth it. And yeah. I don't get me wrong. I'm sure you as a business owner too, I have my days where I'm like, is this really what I'm going to do? For this? No. <laughs> yeah. It could be, but it could be a lot. I would for say sure. the, yeah. I would say the good outweighs the bad though, for sure. Yeah. Most certainly. Yeah. The, the whole franchise thing is really interesting. I didn't, I didn't realize the place was a franchise, but yeah, like you get like, 
you get such a mix of like, unfortunately, you get weeded in with all of the other ones, even though they operate completely, completely independently, right? Obviously, mm-hmm. you have the overlying rules and structure that the franchise owner is going to follow and, and make all of their their franchises follow. But then, I mean, we know that just from like local places around here, like Sit Mean Sit is a very popular one where it's like, you know, independently, there are some of them that are really good, right? And there are some of them that just like, are not great at all and there are some that are owned by people yeah that have zero knowledge of dogs or dog training at all and there are ones that are owned by people that are very competent dog trainers you know Mm -hmm. and uh unfortunately like i said you're always kind of weeded into all of that so yeah that's a that's an interesting one for sure yeah um, yeah. And, and the whole, like the, the employee thing, right? Like we'll see that. I think a lot of times what I found is that you could tell when you meet the person, if they've got that in them, where they are going to want to go and start their own thing eventually. Right. Like I had this girl that worked for me forever ago that has a, a successful dog training business around here now. Who's, who's very good and very competent. And I knew like her and I were so similar, like right off the rip with everything that it was like, I knew like, there's no keeping this person in. Right. But I'm Unfortunately, in a lot of other cases, I find that the people that wind up going off on their own wind up leaving and being forced to start their own company just from the bad circumstances that they're in, right? I mean, that's how I got into this in the first place. Like, I had no inclination of, like, wanting to be a business owner or wanting to start my own dog shop. That that was never even on my radar. I mean, I was so young when I got into this in the first place, but it was like the circumstances in which I was working for were, like, so bad we were forced to just figure it out. And obviously, it worked out for the best, but I think those are the people that if you're running your business properly, right, and you're taking care of them and understanding this isn't this emotional thing, it's just like they're here for a job, right, and they like doing it. And as long as I provide a fantastic working experience and opportunities and stuff for them, you know, you can keep them motivated and in with things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was where I really struggled because, you know, for the last year probably – I've been wanting to find a facility space, but with how the market has been, it's just been a nightmare. And of course, Mm -hmm. when you're looking for something specific to dog training, you have a lot of things that you're looking for. And, you know, a lot of the commercial real estate people around Greensboro, I would tell them, you know, this is, this is what I need, this, this, this. And they're like, you were looking for a needle in a haystack girl. And I'm like, I know, but please help me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fast forward to now, the market's getting a little bit better, but I still haven't found a spot that I feel comfortable with, you know, renting or buying. And that was one thing I think that really pushed her away was because I think she was hanging on to getting the dogs out of her house. Yeah, You know, she was already, and, and I warned her, I was like, the way that you're working, you are going to burn out so quickly. Mm -hmm. And cause she was like, give me all of the dogs, give me all of the lessons. And so I was giving her what she wanted, but I warned her, I was like, you're going to get burnt out because she was also doing a part-time job too. Uh And I was like, you're going to have to, you're going to have to pull back on something, which she did eventually pull back on the part-time job. And now she doesn't do that at all. But you know, I could tell that she was going to, she was going to burn out. And so it, that's what it turned into. She was like, I don't want to do boarding trains anymore. I don't want to board dogs anymore. I don't want to work weekends anymore. I don't want to work nights anymore. And I was like, these are all the things I hired you for. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're going to have to figure something out. And so I tried for a period of time kind of bringing in new programs or kind of putting feelers out for new programs, I'll say. Things that she was more interested in, like, sure. you know, adventure days and day training and stuff like that. Things that I wasn't necessarily interested in. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to where I just ended up creating more work for myself. And it wasn't really the direction I wanted my business going. And so we did have the conversation of, you know, is this where we go our separate ways or, or do we figure it out? And it also was kind of, she was wanting me to kind of, I don't want to necessarily say hold her hand, but she was wanting to do more training together. Yeah. And I just didn't have the flexibility for that. You know, my, my private lesson appointments are, are booked anywhere from four to six weeks out. And I was like, look, we can do that, but we're going to have to schedule it in advance. Yep. And it just never happened. And yeah. fast forward three months after that conversation, she was like, I've been doing this on my own pretty much for three months. Um, I don't need you anymore. I'm going to go do my own thing in the new year. And yeah. I'm like, Okay. And before I could even like read and respond to that, I was already blocked on everything. And I was like, oh, we're doing it this way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
All right. (laughs) So, I mean, it is what it is, but I've, it's, I've definitely learned from it because like you said, like you can kind of tell when you meet someone, if that's the direction they're going to go. And I will say I was, I never saw her leaving and maybe that was just me being naive because she was younger and because of how we did meet and the circumstances we did meet under. Yeah. Um, she had a natural skill set from day one and she had been following me for a while and learning and applying things to her dogs. And then once we met and she got hands on, you know, just kind of took off from there. But I would say, I mean, yeah, I would say people would ask me all the time, do you ever think she's going to leave and go do her own thing? And I would say no. And now, and now I'm like, okay, you're an idiot. You know, like anybody can leave at any time. And I'm sure maybe, maybe my boss for the franchise, you know, felt the same way about me. Oh, she'll never leave and do her own thing. She doesn't know what the hell she's doing. Yeah. And then I did, you know, so it's, I remember at one of the seminars I was at, it was actually in Ohio. It wasn't in Cleveland, but it was near Cleveland. Um, and I was at a seminar at Vanessa canine. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Oh yeah. Yeah. Eric Um, Sambrough. Yeah. Uh And was it the Galvin seminar that he hosted there? Yes. Yeah. 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 And so I was there and there was this dog that they had in their board and train program. And I was one of the only other trainers there. There was a lot of just, you know, people with their dogs, there coming to learn, but I was there just kind of observing as a trainer. I didn't take a dog. And so they let me work with some of the dogs that were there Mm -hmm. and they were like, you know, you have a pretty good skill set and, you know, do you want to work with this dog or this dog or whatever? And there was a dog that nobody could get to lay down, mm-hmm. like just a, a big staffy, just stubborn <laughs> shut down. And, you know, and so I worked with it and I couldn't get him to lay down either. Like he walked well with me, but none of us could get him to lay down no matter what we used, e-collar, prong collar, slip lead. Sure. At one point, they ended up getting a whole freaking pepperoni pizza for this dog <laughs> to motivate it enough to lay down. And it worked. Yeah. Like, it worked. And so then after that, once the dog understood the concept of, you know, what what are you guys wanting and finding something that motivated enough to do it, mm-hmm. um, it worked. And then it was downing no problem. But I remember after that happened that he, you know, was like, hey, I know this guy out in Jacksonville, North Carolina. I know you said you're from North Carolina. Um, he's looking for a couple of trainers, like I'll give him your information and maybe you can get a job out of it. And I was like, cool. Cause at the time I didn't know what I was going to do. Sure. And so in my head, it sounded really good. And I remember him trying to talk me out of running my own business. Yeah. He was like, it's really hard. Like it's a lot that goes into it. It's not just training dogs. Like it's so much more than that. And so of course I'm like, Oh man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have this job offer, but I'd have to move there and I don't really want to move there. But at the same time I'm lost and I don't know what I'm going to do. And it came down to it and I was like, I'm not fucking moving to Jacksonville. Yeah. I'm not doing it. And so then I just started building my website and here we are. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, just like following you online and stuff, like you clearly have done a lot of great work just since 2019, especially since like you said by around the holidays of 2019. I mean, that's really great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I saw, d- did you get bit recently by a dog? <laughs> Yeah. First bite. First, bi- first big bite. I'll say first puncture. You know, everyone gets nipped at and, you know, maybe, maybe a little teeth, but nothing, nothing major. Um, I've had my fair share of nipping and redirection, oh, yeah. but I've never had a full on puncture like that. Uh, it was a good time. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <Good> time. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it was this couple, um, that reached out to me, gosh, when was that? Probably in August, maybe September, it was late summer. And they had given me a very good description of the issues they were dealing with. They have two dogs, um, one, both staffy mixes, but one, I swear it has a little Malinois in it. The other one, I don't know, it'd be like a, a lab pit mix, who knows. But um, both rescue dogs, both very overstimulated very reactive. Um, and the other one, the one that did not bite me was she was just more so reactive, wasn't aggressive. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the one that did bite me, I don't even really want to say aggressive, but just so freaking fearful, like so fearful. And the issue was mom's in a wheelchair has been most of her life. Um, so nothing new to the dogs and there's three, 
three or four kids older, you know, but just a lot going on in the house and no structure, no rules, no boundaries whatsoever. Um, the dogs aren't really taken out often because they were so reactive. And a lot of the reactivity was stemming from kind of guarding mom, trying to get around the wheelchair, under the wheelchair. And, you know, she can only control so much of that situation, um, especially at the time they were both on harnesses. And I'm like, oh, my God, these dogs are just going to, like, pull you down the street. Sure. You know, they're giving you all the power. Um, and I remember specifically when we met, they actually came to my house, which normally I don't do like meet and greets at my house, but because of the situation, they lived almost 30 minutes away. I had them come to me and I couldn't even get within 20 or 30 feet of this dog Mm -hmm. and it was losing its mind. And we talked for probably 45 minutes and I was able to get close to the other dog and she would take food from me and let me take the leash. But that all just kept setting the other dog, dog off more and more and more. Yeah. And so I immediately was like, all right, let's talk muzzle conditioning. I'm going to send you guys videos. This is your homework before we can get started. Da, 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 da. And they had a daughter who was home for a winter break at the time because we didn't start until like November because mm-hmm. uh, I was so far booked out. And so we started in November. That gave them two months to work on the muzzle conditioning. I sent them many videos um, on how to do it. And I told them, you know, reach out if you have any questions or if you have any issues. And they had a daughter that's in school for psychology and she had a natural skill set. I remember at our first lesson, I was like, have you ever worked with dogs before? She was like, no, I just really enjoy it. Like I enjoy learning all that I'm in school for psychology. And I was like, you're a natural. Like if you want a summer internship, girl, hit me up. You yeah. know, like she was just really good and she was super invested and like wanted to learn. And so she was doing a lot of the muzzle conditioning with the dog. Mm-hmm. But the dog, the one that bit me, is very fearful of anything coming around the neck, like yep. slip lead, collar, whatever. And so to get the dog to even want to approach the muzzle, they had to cover it in a towel first. Because sure. without without the towel around it, it was like absolutely not and trying yeah. to even bite the owners. And so eventually they were able to get him to stick his nose in with the towel. Um, and then, you know, we I wasn't able to get them to progress into getting the full clip around the neck to mm-hmm. keep the, the muzzle on. And so fast forward to our first lesson, I was like, all right, where are we at with the muzzle? And they were like, we can't get it on him. We've tried so hard. Da, da, da. And I was like, well, I'm definitely not going to be able to get on him. I can't even get within 20 feet of this dog, you know? Yeah. And I was like, I cannot get my hands on this dog unless it's muzzled. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. And they were like, we completely understand that. And I said, so here's option B. And this is where I, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, so we got two dogs. We got six people. We can copycat train. I'm going to work with this dog. Yeah, yeah. I need to do exactly what I'm doing with this dog, with that dog. Sure. And for the first three lessons, it worked great. Mm -hmm. It worked great. I mean, yes, were the dogs kind of stemming off of each other and freaking out when I first showed up? Yeah, but as soon as I started working the one and the other one just realized I was just going to ignore it, it became neutral over the course of, you know, an hour or so. And and the, the family was able to work with their dog just fine, you know, and he would get a little nippy like I wouldn't even say he was trying to redirect but when they would go to leash him up or collar him up he would you know and just kind of you know nibble but way way less than anything he was trying to do with me 20 feet away oh yeah so I was like all right you guys are going to be the one that has to do all this and they were fine with it and you know each week I would say where are we at with the muzzle conditioning where are we at with the muzzle conditioning you know because I told them I was like I really can't start shifting his mindset to want to trust me and to learn that that's, you know, he doesn't need to bite when he's fearful and all these things until he's muzzled. And I just, I just can't do it. Yeah. And they're like, no, we totally get it. And so I think it was lesson, lesson three or lesson four, lesson four. We, it was a rainy day kind of, we had shifted things inside and I wanted to see kind of the setup of, cause we had been working on place. We'd been talking about, tethered decompression. Um, they weren't crating the dogs. So we brought the crates back into the situation and they said both dogs immediately took right to the crates and they love their crates. And I was like, yep. yeah, no shit. That's, <laughs> they probably have no safe space in this house. They have no idea what's going on. So bringing the crates back helped a lot. So I remember walking in and both dogs were on leash. Both dogs were on their prong collars. We, that was the day we were starting e-collar and, um, the whole lesson went great. We had introduced the e-collars to the one dog so that they could introduce it to the other dog. 
And it was like five minutes before I was walking out the door and fucking oh. FedEx shows up. <laughs> and boo, 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 boo. And so everyone, I, of course, the scenario is there's one dog, you know, the bite dog is further back in the living room. The one I'm working with is closer to the door. Mm-hmm. And I had my back turned to the bite dog and shit happens. The leash slipped out of her hand because she got scared. Of course, the dog got scared. So he's yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and she gets scared. The leash slips out of her fingers and he just gets me right in the back of the leg. Oof. And mm. I had my back turned, so I didn't see it coming. And my body was relaxed because yeah, yeah. I didn't know it was going to happen. So that's good, at least, because he just bit me and then immediately ran back to his oh, place yeah. and laid down. Uh-huh. So, you know, <laughs> full on fear bite. He's not yeah. like trying to like maul me no, no. or hang on and shake or anything. He just bit and ran. And for, you know, the next 15 minutes while I was there cleaning it up and kind of trying to talk to the owner, like, it's OK. Shit happens. This isn't your fault. You yeah. know, whatever. She felt terrible. It was the girl that is in yeah. school for psychology and uh-huh. she felt absolutely terrible. And she's like, oh, my God she's not going to let me shadow her anymore, you know, like, and you could see all the wheels spinning in her head and she's like starting to shut down and cry. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm fine. You're good. We've got to move on from this. Like, look, he's laying down. He knows he fucked up. Like we can't do anything about it right now, but it is what it is. I need to go clean my leg up. Yeah. And so I, I remember going to the bathroom and, you know, looking at it and I was like, okay, this is pretty bad. You know, it looked like someone just took two pins and stuck yeah, yeah, right yeah. back. <laughs> and luckily, <laughs> amazingly, the pants that I was wearing, no holes, yeah. <laughs> like real stretchy, stretchy leggings. There of course, they were tight, which is why the bite was probably as bad as it was. Because yeah. I had no, no fabric loose around my leg. It was right on the leg. Yeah. And it just went in and out. Yeah. And there are still no holes in that in those pants and everyone's like, you need to write a review on those leggings. Like that's amazing. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I I mean, it scarred up pretty good and it hurt like a bitch to clean out, but it was definitely a good learning experience Yeah, yeah. because I told them, I said, okay. So, because of course, you know, well, he's never bit anybody. He's never punctured anybody. Yeah. And I'm like, well, he has now. (laughs) That's fine. Like, so then fast forward, you know, they felt really bad, of course. And um, I told them, you know, it, it's a shitty situation, but this is why we muzzle dogs and, you know, accidents happen and we're going to look, we're all going to learn from this. I was like, I'm not going to bail on you guys. You guys have been great clients. Yeah. Like you are invested into these dogs. You're always asking questions and involved during lessons. You're not just sitting back and letting me do all the work. Like, I want to help you guys because they had told me other trainers when they heard about the dogs or saw the dogs, either told them to euthanize them or they just wouldn't show up and come back. Yeah. And like, that's really shitty. But at the same time, it doesn't surprise me. And so I told them, I said, look, no matter what, the next time I come back, this dog is in a muzzle. Yeah. And they were like, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. I get it. And I'm like, yeah. So even if you do have to force it on him, which I don't like doing, sure, it, it is what it is at this point. If you yeah. want me to continue to work with this dog, because we now see that even if I'm not the one working with him, it can still happen. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, yeah, absolutely no problem. So fast forward a week, I show up, muzzle's not on the dog. Ah! And I was like, my body immediately just starts, Ugh. nervous system takes over and I'm just like, so why isn't he muzzled? And they're like, we couldn't get it on him. Mm-hmm. And I was like, how many times are we going to have to have this conversation? <laughs> you know, like I can't get it on him. Yeah. <clears throat> and and they tell me like, he'll do, he'll stick his nose in and all of these things. And I've seen them collar him up and leash him up and he's okay. Like, and I'm like, that's all you have to do with the muzzle. Yeah. It's the same shit. And why you saw me get full on punctured. Yeah, why, yeah. Are, why are you so afraid of getting nipped? Like yeah, yeah. ball up and do it. Yeah. And so they were like, we're really sorry. And I was like, <laughs> all right. Um, well, I drove out here. Yeah. So we're going to do this lesson, but he's going to be back tied to your wheelchair while we do this <laughs> because I'm not playing any games. Yeah. And they were like, okay, that's fine. And that whole lesson went great. Again, no issues. But by the end of it, mom was walking both dogs loose leash on her wheelchair by herself. Yep. And it was great. But 
then I told her, I was like, look, I'm not going to lie to you. This whole PTSD thing is real. And I, the way my body responded when I showed up and saw that dog, not in a muzzle. Yeah. I can't do that again. And she was very understanding and she was like, okay. And so I told them, let me know when you get, let me know when you get the muzzle on the dog and I'll come back. And so instead they were like, well, we'd rather just you not work with Wes anymore and, and, and just work with Mona. And we're just going to do one-on-ones with Mona from here on out. And yeah, so yeah. that's what we've been doing. And, you know, they're supposed to be applying everything that we're doing with this one dog to the other. <clears throat> um, and that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah. We're starting to introduce triggers to the new dog who doesn't have to be muzzled, but she's now redirecting because of the triggers. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked about muzzling her and I just don't know if they have the heart to do it. Yeah. And I'm like, look, but the dogs that you have and the issues that they're having, you have to. Yeah. Mm. And then they want to talk about boarding. And I'm like, no one is going to board these dogs for you until you get them muzzled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she's just like, I just, I can't, I can't imagine them being in a muzzle for a week. And I'm like, I mean, they can eat, they can drink water, they can pant, Yeah, you know, it is what it is. But if nobody can get their hands on this dog, yeah. it's the only option. And you can tell that they don't like that, but yeah. it is what it is. So I don't know what they're going to do about that. Pass that in like 99%, in like 99% of circumstances where you need to muzzle a dog for boarding. Like usually they don't need it past the first 24 hours or so. Right. And that's what I told him. I was like, once <clears throat> the dog is muzzled yeah. and it learns that it can't bite, and then it realizes that that person that they're with or that area that they're at is the only way that they're going to survive. Yeah. Yeah. We are probably going to get the muzzle off because because they are a big trigger of the dog. Yeah. Yeah. And once they're taken out of the equation, I'm sure the dog is going to flip the switch, you know. Yeah. But I can't even get to that point because yeah. they won't get the muzzle on the dog. And that's one of the that's one of the downsides of of not having a facility or needing to do in home lessons. Where like everybody wants to do in homes because they're like, oh well, you'll be able to see the behavior. You'll be able to see the behavior, and it's like, yeah, like I, you know, seeing the behavior in some circumstances could be beneficial for helping them work through it. But it's like we're starting off with the dog and its most absolute intensified state of mind possible. Where like sometimes right. the dogs come to our facility and listen, they do you know, just from coming in kind of quote unquote, like shut down a little bit because they're so flooded Mm -hmm. with stimulation going on around them. But it's like that could help get them to a place where things are at least a little bit more manageable, where we could start some of the training and be a little bit safer about stuff and get some little victories in before we address that big thing, you know? Right. Yeah. And that's why I told them, I was like, we have to bring the crate back. Yeah, for sure. Because of course they were like, well, we crated when they were puppies, but Now we don't. And so these dogs, when no one was home, both of them, not that they were fighting with each other, but they were very codependent on each other and codependent on the owners and just extreme separation anxiety. But you add in genetics that was made everything 10 times more. But I mean, they're barking at everything. They have free reign of everything. There's no boundaries or rule in the house. And so I was like, just adding in these little, little rules you might see a huge shift. Sure. And they did, and they told me, you know, definitely when they brought the crate back, and I don't think they were utilizing place as much as they should have. Sure. Um, Cause you know, some people will only utilize it within a training session or within, you yep. know, training with uh, uh, the trainer, but outside of the training session, we know is where it's 10,000 times more yep. important and successful. Yep. Um, but yeah, I, she just, I just don't know if, <clears throat> if they're able to give these dogs what they really need for the issues that they're having. Yeah. I hope that they can somehow have that realization, but we're just not there yet. Yeah. I think for some people it's really hard for them to see, you know, see like the light at the end of the tunnel with stuff, especially when they're seeing how bad the behavioral issues are. And they're like, they don't feel confident that they're able to like get the dog even under control enough to put a muzzle on them. They see the dog bite somebody, this, that, like, it's just like this compounding emotion on them of like, I'm so stressed out. I'm so stressed out. I don't think this dog can get anywhere where we had a a similar case. This dog Thor we had in recently who was massively fearful and he wasn't like pursuing people or anything by any means but like yeah putting collars on him putting muzzles on him anything like that he would absolutely bite you and with a decent amount of intensity and I remember when the dog came to drop him off for the board training he was like yeah I can't get the muzzle on him I was like 
you have to. <laughs> Right. And I, right. I sat there with him and I'm like, listen, like I'll coach you through it. Like I stood behind a gate. I was like, I was like, I'll coach you through the, what you're going to need to do to do it. But like, if you have a good enough relationship with this dog, which he did, right. The dog right. will fight you, but it's unbelievable. The amount of bite inhibition, some dogs can like respect towards their handler under circumstances of like high stress. Right. And he went to go put that muzzle on that dog. And I'll tell you, we, we filmed the whole thing. We have the whole thing on our freaking vlog. I'm going to put that muzzle on him. That dog fought him for like 10 minutes on it. He's trying to get away. He's running. He's thrashing around and stuff. Wasn't trying to bite him. I mean, he's nipping and stuff a little bit, but wasn't trying to bite him. And he got that thing on him eventually. And the really cool thing about it was, listen, you know, like, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you from the standpoint of like, if we have the, the ability to like properly get the dog comfortable with the muzzle and build a positive association with it and stuff like that, that's always going to be ideal. Um, but i from that point on, that dog's intensity of fighting, having things done that he didn't want, went from like here down to here because he just realized because the owner had that massive victory of, listen, man, you're going to fight this all day long. It's still going to happen, right? Yeah. And he got into a much, much better state of mind just from that alone. And the owner had that victory of like, all right, like this was, we got this right. thing done we that I- yeah, that right. I didn't think I was going to be able to do, and and we were able to to get right into the training and stuff at that point. But it's like sometimes you need to like literally just hold their hand through that. Like, listen, like I'm, yeah. I'm going to help you through this. I know it's going to be really hard, but once they start having those little victories, it could be so so impactful for them. Yeah, and I really think had the daughter not gone back to school because she's back in school now. Sure. And I really think had she not gone back to school she could have got it done. Yeah. She had the emotional ability to do it. You could tell she wanted to do it, but the owners, I feel like the owners are just as fearful yeah. as, you know, a stranger. <laughs> and it's like, you are the one that has the relationship. This dog is guarding and protecting yeah. you. This dog is codependent on you. It has separation anxiety from you. It has to be you, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. but they just won't do it. And it's yeah. been, like I said, I've been working with these people since the fall. Yeah, yeah. So my heart hurts for them yeah. because I can see, like, if we can just get this fucking puzzle off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You know, 100%. we can turn the corner, but I can't. So yeah. you know, I'm just helping the other dog right now, and it is what it is, I guess. Being fearful of your dog is such a weird thing, right? Like right. It's, 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 <laughs> it's one of the only aspects of dog training that I find when I talk to people and they come to me and say, I have this dog and I'm scared of this dog, right? Like, what do I do about it? And, and there is no solution other than like, you kind of said it, you've got to kind of like sack up at some point and like, I'm either not going to be scared of this dog or I'm going to have to get rid of it. Right. Yeah. Like there's and that's really, why I told him, like, there's not an alternative. It's gonna, the point where he's going to bite somebody <clears throat> and you're either going to have to put him down or they're going to take him from you. Yeah. Like, and it's probably going to be the latter. Like, yeah. It's just, I don't know. And, and so, yeah, when they told me, like, yeah, well, we're going on this trip in July and we need somewhere to board him, I was like, good sure. fucking luck. You yeah, know, yeah. like, I am here to help as much as I can. But until we get a muzzle on that dog, I'm telling you right now, no one is going to board that dog. Yeah. Yeah, a single person. We have a we have a client that moved to, uh, or, or lives in Chicago. Did a board and train with us that has like a, a pretty challenging dog, and uh, she's got a couple trips coming up. and And she was trying to find somebody that would board the dog. And just because of the dog's history, like nobody would would touch this dog, you know. And we had to, man. I went through like my whole freaking like rolodex of people calling, and we finally found like two places that would that would accept the dog for boarding. But yeah, I mean, when you got a dog like that, that's another thing I think people need to factor in when they're looking for either a training company or, or have a dog that's like that is, is how much do you travel? And are you going to be able to figure out accommodations for this? Because right. you could do all the training in the world. We know training doesn't like fix dogs and just make them so you could board right. them anywhere and, and they're going to be fine. You know, that's always been one of the biggest things that, that appealed people to us is like, we'll board clients that have done training with us. And Same. the, the, the funny thing we saw is like there were some places in Chicago that I reached out to that are like reputable training companies that have similar policies of like we only accept trained clients, which is a great policy to have. But even then, they had this like caveat on it of like, but even if you do training with us, there's not a guarantee that we're going to board the dog. <laughs> okay. so, so I don't know. It's yeah, I'm the same way because I have, I mean, and I, it's funny that you say that because I was just looking last night. I was like, I should probably take that off my Instagram because it says boarding 
but it's under yeah. like, you know, board and train, private lessons, e-collar training, and sure, then there's sure. boarding. But I feel like people see that and they're like, oh, let me board my dog. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. I have, we have to work with it first. You know, I can't just be out here boarding these dogs that aren't crate trained and don't know how to walk on a leash. I don't have time for that shit, you know, like, yeah. so, and I don't mind boarding dogs. You know, I have a, a girl that does backup <laughs> boarding for me now. She was a client at first and then now she does a lot of boarding for me since my other employee left. And that's worked out great, but she kind of has the same policy. She goes, yeah, ever since I started taking your dogs, I won't board dogs that haven't trained with you. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't blame you because you, it's just too much. Yeah. Back in the day, uh, my my first company that I had when we first started it, we would accept like anybody for boarding. And man, mm-hmm. we would run into so many situations where these dogs would come in and they'd be so bad. And then we wind up doing more work with those dogs than we would like the boarding trains that we <laughs> had in. Right. Just to manage them safely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's wild. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that- my sister... Um, my sister's out in California and she did virtual training with me for her dog Mm -hmm. and she was kind of doing the same thing. She was like, yeah, I feel like I'm just going to like, you know, get on Rover and board dogs for fun. She was like, it was so fun training my dog and I've learned so much and now I kind of want to help other people. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm like, that's great. And then she always texts me, you know, like this dog won't shut the fuck up. This dog (laughs) won't show the fuck out. This dog won't get in a crate and this dog pisses everywhere and all these things. And so she eventually got to the point last year. She was like, I can't, I can't take dogs that aren't trained. I can't stand it. And I'm like, good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Love that. Uh, So I'm interesting to, I'm interested to talk about your, your journey with the like crate anxiety with your one dog. Cause I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with. I know uh, my Malinois, when I got him had absolutely freaking horrendous kind of anxiety as well. So that's something I experienced with him and stuff as well. And Mm -hmm. I think a big misconception with crate anxiety or or separation anxiety or any of those types of things is that you're going to hit this point where it just completely dissolves and goes away, right? Like we have a Mm -hmm. couple clients I can think of that have dogs that have kennel anxiety that went from, you know, breaking out of the crate, having regular accidents in the crate, uh, you know, literally nonstop, constantly barking and stuff like that. And we'll hit this point where it's like, they could be kenneled safely. They don't try to break out of the crate. You're not coming home to a mess all the time. They don't bark constantly the entire time, but maybe they do for a couple of minutes when you leave the house, or maybe they do for you know a couple minutes once you get home before you let them out of the crate or something like that. And I find myself in a lot of cases really educating and coaching people through one, realistic expectations with it, and two, recalibrating like what victory is to them with things. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So I'm curious, like, at, since you had, you know, your dog was in such a bad place with it, how you combated that and what kind of those micro victories you saw along the way were and how you currently manage that still if you need to, or if it is just at a place where it's like not even something you need to worry about. Yeah. So there is, there's a lot that goes into that. So he's <laughs> nine now. Sure. Um, he's laying right here next to me, just so beautiful. I love him. (laughs) He's my heart dog, but he's nine years old. I adopted him from the shelter when he was just over a year. Mm -hmm. So he was like 13 months, I think. And when I got him, you know, he was was big, strong dog. You know, he's jumping over the kennel and, you know, pulling me out the door. And I'm just like, you're so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like you're out of control, but I freaking love you. That's right. And I adopted him and he was fine in the crate for the first month, Mm. but then I moved Ah. and when I moved, everything changed. Interesting. So of course he went from the shelter. The shelter said he was an owner surrender. He was an outside dog that they tried to be a hunting dog. He was terrified of gunshots. So the owner came and dumped him and his brother and his brother had gotten adopted just a few days before I got him. Sure. So... I got a crate for him right away. I was living with my sister at the time. She did not want me to have a dog, but she eventually caved. And he was great for that first month. And then when I moved into my own apartment, uh, yeah, he immediately, you know, I put him in the crate and left because he had been fine. So I thought he would be fine. Sure. And I came home and he was out of the crate and I was, but the, the door was still shut. And I was like, how the fuck did you do that? And so that's when I was like, immediately, like, I'm going to get a camera so I can see how he's doing this. And so I would put the camera up and I only worked five minutes down the road. So my boss luckily was really, really nice and was like, if you see him freaking out on the camera, trying to hurt himself, like just run home real quick and and get him. Yeah. And so I did that for a couple of weeks. You know, he would not try to break out until probably like 
20, 30 minutes in, he would definitely be screaming and howling and all of these things, but he wouldn't actively try to physically get out until about 20, 30 minutes in. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as I see, you know, see him loading up on the camera, I'm like, all right, let me drive home. So by the time I get home, he's not hurting himself. I'll get him out, calm him back down. Yeah. Um, and eventually it got to the point where I just started taking him to work with me, which I know does not help, but I took him to work with me. And then my boss eventually after like a month, she's like, all right, you're gonna have to figure something out. You can't keep bringing this dog to work with you every day. Mm -hmm. Cause then of course everyone wanted to bring their dogs to work <laughs> with him. And so we tried it again. And I remember I got, um, freaking like, like master locks mm -hmm. to like, lock around the corners of the crate yep. and we zip tied the corners of the crate and he's still just bucking and pollen and all these things to where he's like has like scratches on his face yeah. and you know he's like bleeding and he's got mm -hmm. diarrhea and vomit and like just he's so stressed and so that's when I um you know my ex and I he, we hadn't met yet, but he had been a customer at my work because I worked at a pet store. Yep. So he was a customer there. And I remember just reaching out to him and be like, what do I do? Yeah. Like, what do I do? And he was like, have you ever heard of e-callers? And I was like, no, but I'll try anything at this point. You know, I don't <laughs> care. And because I was, again, he was very food motivated. He had no problem eating in the crate, no problem going in the crate, especially if I was going to give him food. Mm -hmm. It was if I shut the door and I left. So I, you know, he was like, well, have you tried just like setting it up like you're leaving, but you're not really leaving. So you can go back in and correct him when he tries to get out. And so I was like, no. So we started doing that, trying that. And, you know, I, I don't even remember how I first started correcting him. I think it was like a, a water bottle or a pet corrector, that little red can of air. Oh, yeah. And it would work, you know, for a second or a minute. And then if I actually left again, 10, 20 minutes in, he'd start going and going and going and eventually get out. And I'm just like, no, I mean, I think at one point I had like 80 zip ties on yeah. this crate. And I mean, he's like flipping the crate over and like, it was just insane. Like yeah. the worst I had ever seen for sure. And I just was like, I don't know what to do. You know, I was like crying every day and he was hurting himself. And I was just like, this dog is literally going to kill me and get me kicked out of this apartment. But I love him so much. <laughs> and so then I got introduced to e-callers and, you know, I made sure that if he was in the crate, you know, he had been for a walk, he had been given food and water. We had done some type of training or play or something, you know, all the things to make yeah. sure he's going in there tired. And I remember at the time, I think we started, I don't even, this was 10 years ago, so I don't really remember, but we started at a pretty high level just sure. to see if it would stop and shut him down. <clears throat> and we probably tried vibrate first, I'm sure. But that clearly did nothing. And I think I remember like we were up in like the 60s and the 80s yep. and, you know, and he's, ar, 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 you know, freaking out, screaming. Oh, yeah. And eventually it stopped, Yeah, you know, like and and I know looking back, I'm like, there are so many things that I could have done or should have done differently, but I just didn't have the knowledge at the time. And eventually, I mean, for me, it he's a headstrong dog. It didn't shut him down, sure. you know, <clears throat> correcting him at that high of a level. It stopped his explosive, ridiculous behavior. Yeah. And so it did eventually get to the point where I, and I'm not sitting here, you know, frying him, holding it down, but I would just, you know, dial up, pop him, dial oh, yeah. up, pop him, dial up, pop him until we found a level that he finally stopped. Mm -hmm. And it was like mm -hmm. up in the eighties where he finally stopped. And, you know, and it wasn't like just, a flip of a switch, like he got corrected and then he never did it again. It was a process of yeah. probably two or three months of consistently trying to set that situation up, correct the behavior, and then move on. And eventually, yes, just like you said, he, he did get to the point where he just stopped. Mm -hmm. Now, there was probably a handful of times when I was in that apartment that he would still get out. Mm -hmm. Because, and I, and I don't know what triggered it. You know, I either didn't check the camera or I, he didn't get a correction. So he was like, whatever, fuck this. I'm going to try it. But eventually, you know, it did stop. And then I remember I moved again yeah. out of the apartment into a house and we started all over. Yep. So it's like moving <clears throat> obviously was triggering him, shifting the environment, changing the routine. All of those things triggered him. 
But now he had a better understanding of the tool. Yeah. And again, at this time, I was only using the e-collar as a correctional tool. Mm -hmm. And so I, my corrections were much lower. You know, I could correct him at like a 20 or a 30 and he sure. would stop. Mm -hmm. um, but then I learned how e-collars, you know, were supposed to be used. And we started doing e-collar conditioning that way, which really changed the game for us. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't just this correctional tool anymore. And I did use it in so many other ways to communicate. And I feel like his needs were definitely being met a lot more in a way that I didn't understand before with him being a hound dog. Mm -hmm. He's a, um, he's a beagle Ridgeback, um, staffy mix. Oh yeah. So it's got a whole lot going on there. Mm -hmm. Um, supposedly a little bit of Siberian in there. It said 12.5%, which he is a singer. He will howl and sing, but yeah. that could easily be the beagle or the hound and sure. anything like that. But, um, to this day, fast forward, you know, eight, eight, nine years, he is perfectly fine in the crate, yeah. no matter where we go. Mm -hmm. If we, if I go to my dad's, if I go to my sister's, if I go to an Airbnb, if, you know, no matter where we go, if that crate's there, he's mm -hmm. like, that's where I eat. That's where I sleep. Now he doesn't sleep in the crate for me. Like at my house, he doesn't sleep in the crate anymore. He's just on place in, sure. in the bedroom. Um, but if I'm traveling, you know, he'll definitely sleep in the crate. Um, and he has no problem with it. He's perfectly fine with it. He loves the crate. He will run right in there to go get his food and he'll lay down. Um, and he's fine. Now, will I come home to him howling sometimes? Yes. Yep. But I don't care. <clears throat> you know, I, I walk in the door, I tell him off and he stops. Yep. And I don't have to correct him anymore. I can just give a verbal off. But yep. it's been eight, nine years of consistency yep. mm -hmm. plus a whole bunch of other shit yep. that has really changed that. But I I mean, I don't think he's broken out of a crate in I I can't even remember the last time. It's been absolutely it's been years. Yeah. Years. That's awesome. Yeah, I very similar in my case. So Vinny didn't have the issues with breaking out of the crate necessarily, but he would get himself so freaking spun up in that crate that it was, I mean, just full Malinois, like absolute insanity. Yeah. <laughs> and regularly having accents in the crate, you know, diarrhea, peeing everywhere, all that kind of stuff. And um, it, it, very similar process where it was a lot of like setting it up, right. Correcting for it, interrupting that state of mind, interrupting that state of mind. And in his case, like he would have a similar cycle, right. His like sequence of escalation was he would start spinning in circles in the crate mm -hmm. before he started riling himself up and same deal, interrupting that, interrupting that, interrupting that. And, and it was a long process as well. I mean, he used to be, I used to live at the facility, um, that we have for a while. And I used to not even be able to have him like in the facility while I was doing lessons. Cause like if he could hear me while he was in the crate doing something, it would put him into an absolute freaking frenzy. Like I would have to take him out to my car and put him in the crate in my car. Cause that was the only place he would be calm. Like he loved to. You're like, I promise car. I'm a good dog trainer. Just don't worry about that yeah. dog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Right. And, you know, it's one of those things where we're similar, right? Like, if I get home from work, right? Like, yeah, like, he's usually, you know, a little wound up and, and antsy to get out of the crate. But, like, he almost never has an accident in it anymore. Like, he mm -hmm. doesn't freak out constantly. Like, he's downstairs on the first floor right now in his crate just chilling and stuff. And, you know, as a long-term, you know, it's a constant management game from the standpoint of, like, I do need to be mindful of, you know, if my wife and I are going to be leaving at weird hours to go somewhere, you know, making sure he gets a couple extra runs outside before I stick him in in case right. he starts getting himself spun up you know every now and then I'll put him in the crate and if you know something exciting is going to be going on on the first floor I make sure he has his e-collar on in case I start noticing him doing a little bit of pacing and spinning right. and stuff but it's so manageable at this point and I don't care when I come home because he's he's a dog right like he's going to be excited right. to see me when I exactly. get home and how I, old is your mouth He's about the same age now, so he's gonna he's about okay. like nine or so at this point. Yeah. So uh, similar journey. I got started right around the same time as you. I've been doing this about ten years as well, and it's so interesting. That was another thing that I had on my list is like the dog training freaking climate like ten years ago is so different than it was right now. Too. Yes, <laughs> like from social media and from everything. But oh I my god. I think some people really get in their head with like anxiety issues or things like that, that they're going to make their dog just like absolutely perfect. 
And mm-hmm. by shifting that expectation from like, let's make the dog just absolutely adore the crate and never make a peep in it and not even be excited when we get home and this and that and blah, blah, blah. You do yourself and your dog such a disservice because like you're holding them to this unrealistic standard where where they're right. at with things is perfectly fine, right? They're safe, they're comfortable, and uh, it's not causing you all of the problem and headache that it was before. But uh, those unrealistic expectations, past just great anxiety with everything else can be so detrimental for people's success, I think. Yeah, well, that and it's funny you say that because kind of that on top of people thinking like, oh, my dog's already stressed out. My dog's already anxious. (laughs) Me correcting them is only going to make it worse. Yeah. I'm like, actually. Yeah. Incorrect. Let's talk about that. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, talk about that. Educate, educate the people on that because that's a common thing that we're answering for people as well. Yeah. So for me, it's like, okay, when we have a dog that's in this unhealthy of a mindset and we've never tried just correcting or interrupting that, that behavior, what do you have to lose? You know, but for me, I mean, it's more than that because of course I'm talking about the relationship Mm -hmm. of, you know, with the owner and what, what a normal day in their life looks like. You know, a lot of people think a backyard is all the dog needs and it's like, heck no, if you have a backyard, like, Mm -hmm. That's only going to amp your dog up more if you're not meeting those other needs, like taking them on a walk or engaging in play and all of these other things. And I think some people just get so wrapped up in the emotions of how they feel. Mm -hmm. And then they put it on their dog, which probably only makes it worse for a lot of these dogs. Mm -hmm. And so they just, I really, some people just don't have the heart to do it. And so I've had some people that have just come to me like, I know what my dog needs in terms of like, I know that they need crated and I know that this behavior needs corrected and I know this, that, and the other, but I just can't do it. Yeah. Can you do it for me? (laughs) And like, I just had a puppy board and trained with that situation as a little boxer puppy. And the owner was like, I had trained another boxer for them a few years back, but he had passed away. So they got a new one and it came from a situation where, you know, it was inside for 10 weeks with all of its litter mates, never been outside, only used pee pads, you know, like everything was just a free for all. So this dog had severe separation anxiety and absolutely hated the crate. And so the mom was like, she's like, I tried, you know, the first two or three nights, but he's just in there screaming and chewing the bars and I just can't do it. So I let him sleep in the bed with me. <laughs> and now he sleeps for 10 hours and yeah, yeah. he's great. And uh-huh. I'm like, <clears throat> okay but he's only four months old, you know, like this is bad. And so she was like, I know that he needs crate train. I just can't do it. Yeah. And so he came to me and those first 48 hours were, were intense. Yeah. I mean, it was like, it was like boomer (laughs) 2.0, you know, but 10 years later. And I mean, he was no problem going in the crate, no problem coming out of the crate. He wouldn't eat in the crate for the first probably four or five like exercises that we did in that first day. He would go in and he would come out, but he wouldn't eat in there. He wasn't, you could tell he was like not a fan, but he was willing to go in and out. And, you know, of course, when I'm only going to offer the food while we're training, I'm not going to offer you any other treats or any other food while we're here. You're just going to work for your kibble. Of course, he's going to get hungry. He's a four month old puppy. Mm -hmm. So by the end of that first day, he's going in and inhaling the food in the crate. You know, he's, he's hungry. And so he was motivated. And even after reps of the crate reps on place, working his little brain and all of these things, he'd go in, I'd shut the door and I'd just wait. I'd just hang out and he would be fine. Mm -hmm. As soon as I walk out of the room and he can't visually see me, it's on. Yeah. And so I'd go in there um, and I would just, you know, approach the crate and I'd tell him no. And he would just, you know, mm-hmm. lay down because she's like, oh, he knows what no means. And I'm like, well, how does he know what yeah, no yeah. means? <laughs> you know, she's like, well, we've told him no and pulled him off of the cat or we've told him no and pulled him out of the trash yeah. or, you know, all these things. And I'm like, okay, we'll see. And he did, you know, he did respond well to the word, but I think he responded more to the spatial pressure of me coming in. It's the emotions and, surrounding. No, right. we see that a lot. It's right. Like we project a strong emotion at the dog. So they sense that like, we're not happy and you'll see their demeanor change obviously, but they're still not necessarily understanding it from the <laughs> spectrum of like a clear, precise word that can identify something specifically. It's more the overarching, exactly. yeah, aura right. that that it means. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I was telling her, I was or asking her, I was like, how how does he know? How yeah, do you yeah. know that he knows what no means? Mm-hmm. 
And she's like, well, I say it and he usually stops. And I'm like, yeah, there's yeah. that word usually. <laughs> like, <laughs> but he did very, by the time he went home, had a very clear understanding of the word no. Sure. Because we always followed through with the leash when we were using it. Yep. But eventually I told her it, those first 48 hours, you know, there was a lot of screaming and there was, I didn't get much sleep those first few nights. Yeah. And he wasn't on a regular potty schedule because they weren't utilizing the crate enough, especially during the day. She said, he's in the crate all day while I'm gone at work. I don't have the heart to keep him in the crate at night because I, I just don't want him to be in there that long. Yeah. And I'm like, you know how much sleep puppies need? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she's like, how much? I'm like, some puppies can sleep damn near 18, 20 hours a day. Oh yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like, why does it matter if he's sleeping on the floor, yeah. in the bed, on your lap versus the crate? Like, yep. why does why does that hurt you so much? If he's sleeping, why does it matter where the hell he's sleeping at? And she's like, yeah, I guess you have a point. Mm-hmm. But she said she really <laughs> just didn't have the heart to do it. So fast forward to the end of the boarding train, dogs going home, running into the crate, laying down you know, waiting to come out when you release him. And she's like, oh, this is all I ever wanted is I just wanted to see that he wanted to go in there and see that he was happy in there. And by the time, you know, five minutes and him going, he's in there freaking snoring with the door open, just like super chill. And then he goes home and I told her, I told her, I said, be ready. Transition days are hard. You know, the first night or two that the dog's home, they are going to think everything that just happened is over with. Oh yeah. We're back home. Let me back in that bed. You know, and so I told her, I said, tonight, he's probably going to sleep pretty good because he's going to be exhausted from the day and from the week. Mm -hmm. But tomorrow, be ready. And so I checked in on her and I said, all right, how would our first 24 hours go? And she said, honestly, at first it was going really well. But then around three in the morning, he started screaming and doing what he normally does. Mm -hmm. And I said, what did you do? And she said, I let him out. And I was like, ah. I was like, did you let him out to use the bathroom or did you let him out to bring him in bed? She's like, no, I let him out. He used the bathroom. He went and then I brought him back inside, put him in the crate and he whined for a little bit and then he went to sleep. And I was like, okay, proud of you. Thank you. Like, I was like, I don't love that you let him out when he was screaming like a maniac, Mm -hmm. but you did take him out, go to the bathroom and then you put him back and he whined for a little bit and you went to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I said, let me know how tomorrow goes because tomorrow might be worse. And she said, actually, he was great. And I was like, You know, like, good. So I told her, I was like, if you can really push through this first week back home, we should be in the clear. Yeah. And I was like, I know it's going to be really hard, especially for you, because they have a very weird dynamic, too. I love this couple and they're married, but they don't sleep together in the same bed because dad gets up a lot earlier than mom. And mom Mm. is a very light sleeper and gets mad if dad wakes her up. And so they sleep in separate bedrooms. And I'm like, to each their own. But that's why she wanted the dog in the Ah. bed, because she she doesn't have her husband in the bed, you know? Uh Uh-huh. And I'm like, okay, so let's get like a teddy bear or something, not the dog, you know, (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Or I looked at the husband, like, maybe you should just get over it and get in the bed with her. Like, I don't know. But, um, you know, so I'll probably check in on them this weekend, but she hasn't reached out saying, you know, like, I can't get him to stop screaming or she was incessantly checking her cameras, which was not good for her while she was at work. That's a big one I find for people is when you have those cameras on the first thing I tell everybody is you got to get those things and just, just like throw them away or only use them if you're setting up an exercise to like actually work on the dog. So, cause she's like, she's like, Megan, I look at the camera as soon as I leave, as soon as I get to work, I check it all the time. And I said, you are killing yourself. Stop checking the camera. Yeah. It just doesn't matter. Like Like, as long as the dog's not hurting, like it literally doesn't, if the dog is up, like sitting at the crate door, like whimpering a little bit or something, it literally just doesn't matter. (laughs) Yeah. And so, well, and she did say that she came home from work yesterday and the crate was across the room. Mm. So he had like pushed himself across the room at some point. But she said, I only checked the camera once and it was during lunch and he was fine. So I don't know when he did that. And I was like, okay, great. If you want to check the camera once a day, I'll let you do that. But you can't check it every hour, every 10 minutes. Like, stop. That's not good for you. Mm -hmm. Um, And so she has gotten better at that. And I do think, too, obviously, you know, once once she realizes he is calming down, because I told her, I said, you just have he has the skill set. He has the ability. It's you that has to do it. Mm -hmm. And her husband, of course, is there like. You hear that? You hear that? You know, the husband, the husband is on my side and yeah, yeah. he understands, you know, that she is the problem and she understands that she is the problem. And she really does want what's best for this dog. Yeah. Because she learned so much from the last dog. But I think just it's an unfortunate situation. The dog that they rescued, you know, came from a really shitty background and we're going to have to work through these things. Yeah. But she did, she does see the light at the end of the tunnel. So that is. 
good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes everybody's got their motivation with that stuff, right? Like everybody that says like, I'm a, I either don't want to do this or I can't do this or I don't have the heart to do this. The second they like see really how it works, right? That like so much can be accomplished, right? Mm-hmm. And, and they could just understand how important it is. It's interesting. We had a client one time that had a puppy that same deal was having a lot of issues with uh, like separation anxiety and stuff. And they never created the dog since it was, mm-hmm. since they brought the dog home because the, the, the wife said, yeah, I just, I get migraines when the dog is like crying or something. I was like, but you got a puppy. That's like saying like, I'm going to have right. a newborn baby, but it can't make any noise. It it's can't like, cry. it right. doesn't work that way. <laughs> like those two things don't equate. Right. So funny. Yep. And I, I mean, honestly, Obviously, we just had Christmas not long ago, so there are hella puppies around yeah, right yeah. now. Mm-hmm. And that's I feel like that's all I've had recently is puppy after puppy after puppy. Yeah. And a lot of them have had separation anxiety already at such yeah. a young age. And I'm like, what in the hell is in the water? What is going on? Yeah. And it's just because people don't have the heart to create these dogs. Yeah. And past that, it's just like the the climate of how we own dogs now. It's like puppies are just this fucking novelty, man. It just drives me crazy when I say, like, listen, I get it. Puppies are adorable and we want to pick right. them up all the time and carry them and kiss them and cuddle them and do all those types of things. But it's like, it, it's literally all that people do now, right? They take the dogs everywhere and let it just be a free for all. Every single person that they see is giving them attention. Funny you right? say that because like, literally last <laughs> night I was wrapping up a lesson downtown and we had three dogs just chilling, you know, kids are running around everywhere. And here comes these two ladies walking by with these two fluffy ass puppies in their hand, mm-hmm. puts them down, oh, not yeah. on a leash, Yep. just expects them to follow. And so, of course, we're all like body blocking our dogs from the puppies and they just take them over into this field and they're like, oh, they won't run away. Yeah. And I was like, why do we just assume these things yeah. now? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. yeah, it's a puppy. It's yeah. still stumbling. It can't really run that fast. You can probably catch it. But yes. why are we... Why are we starting here? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's insane. And it's like people, people think the eight week old dog that they have is going to be what it's going to be like when it's two years old, you know, right. without realizing like, like this the- puppy has so it's yeah. going to grow so much and change so much in this first year, if not two years. Mm-hmm. And they lock in on these behaviors in the dog right now, which yeah. it's like, yeah, focus on the dog in front of you. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, if you don't understand all of those hormonal changes and, and physical changes and psychological changes that are going to be happening over the course of the next couple of years. Oh yeah. Buckle up because (laughs) it is not going to be a smooth sale. That's why the number one age we get dogs that come in for is like anywhere from like eight months to a year and a half. Cause it's like the second they hit that like second fear period and start maturing, it's like, boom, like that puppy that they had that was maybe just a little skittish and stuff just starts becoming a freaking monster. Well, that or I sometimes will see the opposite where the puppy is younger and they're insecure. So they want to follow the owner because they're not confident in the world. And then they get that confidence and it's like, peace out. I don't need you anymore. And they're all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so much can change. You know, the world very quickly starts becoming more interesting to them when they can like, yeah, use their legs a little bit better and Mm -hmm. open their eyes fully. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, yep. Awesome. Well, listen, uh, what, um, th- I love I love asking trainers this question. Like what has you really excited in the dog training world right now, whether from a client standpoint or from a training standpoint or from what you're experimenting with and doing, like what's got you really excited right now about dogs? Honestly, it's really sad, but I don't know how to answer that question because I feel like since my employee left, it has just been one thing after the other and I can't catch up and I'm burnt out and I'm just like, when is this going to stop? Oof. Well, that's not good. I know. That's why I was like, honestly, (laughs) this is really sad, but I, but if I had to, to think of something, I would say for me, it's getting the dogs that are so shut down or so fearful Mm -hmm. or the owners are so shut down and just emotionally exhausted and then getting to kind of rebuild that relationship and see the change in the dog. Like those are my favorite dogs to work with yeah. are the fearful shut down dogs mm-hmm. um, because I've seen the shift yeah. so many times again and again and again. And to just build them up and give them that confidence and give them just that healthier, healthier quality of life. Like it's not like one of the boarding trains I've had right now, I've had her almost three weeks Um and she's a five-year-old Newfoundland who just 
had zero rules and boundaries. They yep. took the crate away after the first year because she's so big. You know, she's 120 pounds. Mm-hmm. So, and she just was so stressed, so unhealthy. You could see it in her face. Yep. You could see it in her tongue. You could see it in her eyes. Like she was so much older yep. than what she should have been because of the stress and anxiety that she had. And I remember day one bringing her in and just reintroducing the crate. And she just chilled out. Like the sense of calmness came over and she's like, oh my God, I'm safe. Like yeah. I'm okay. And since then, like, yeah, first week or two, she was she was still kind of stressed, didn't really want to eat. Um, and definitely, you know, using her body weight to try and get out of things. She was very fearful. Yeah. And now she's to the point where she is so excited to get up and get out. She loves riding the treadmill. She loves getting in the car. She loves just going out and just being a dog. And you could tell it, it's like she has her life back almost because she just was either overly anxious all the time or she was completely fearful and shut down. Yeah. And if she was at home with the people that are going to spoil her and give her the chicken and, you know, their dinner plate and, and just play and not do anything else. Yeah, she she was great. But if you asked her to do anything, it's not going to happen. Yep. And you take her outside and she's immediately pancaking and tucking tail and not moving, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it is an unfortunate situation with her and, you know, in particular is the family's moving. They're in a apartment right now temporarily while they're waiting for the house to be done and she can't be in the apartment. So she was living with dad and sure. then mom had a baby and dad's overfeeding and dad's spoiling and all these things. So it's just a lot of inconsistencies. Oh, yeah which I've been very clear about that all needs to change you know, regardless where she's going. Yeah, but definitely, I would say that's the thing that keeps, keeps me going is when I come across those dogs and those clients yeah. and really seeing the shift in the lifestyle yeah. of the owner and of the quality of life in the dog. Yeah. A hundred percent. That's definitely what, what keeps me going. I really love, um, you know, we talked uh, a lot over the course of this episode about like clients that like, you know, the, the common theme has been, I feel like clients that don't necessarily think they have it in them to do some of the things that they think they need to do with their dogs. And I mm-hmm. absolutely love just going in and just trying to figure out what is that thing that I can do to help motivate you to make these changes you need to. And when you get, when you figure that thing out, like it's like everybody, it drives me so crazy when I hear trainers talk about like, oh, the clients don't give a shit or, or, or this or that. Cause it's like, if somebody is paying you money for a service under 99% of circumstances, like they want your help. Now, they may not always like the things that you're telling them to do. Change is always difficult for people. It's always right. difficult for dogs. But if you could figure out what is that one thing that's going to help motivate them and then pass that, what things might I be doing that maybe are unnecessary for this individual situation that is causing a decrease in motivation? Am I making things too complicated for them? Am I making right. them focus on things that are kind of unrelated to their end goal that are more for me than they are for them? You know what I mean? And and mm-hmm. I love really trying to get to the bottom of that kind of stuff. That's one of my favorite things. Yeah, and lately um, I've been, well, last, gosh, was it last year or was it year before? I don't even remember, but I, I ended up writing a ebook and it was for my board and train clients. Yep. So basically here's a 50 page ebook of everything that you need to know while I have your dog so that when I start talking to you about this stuff, you're familiar with some of the terms and some of the protocols and the tools. So it's not all just, you know, a shell shock to you. It's a lot of information to take in, especially sure. if it's brand new. So breaking it up over the course of three or four weeks while I have the dog and allowing you to physically have it in front of your face on top of everything you're seeing me, you know, send you and what I post to you on social media. It's helping bridge a lot of gaps yep. and it's making it a lot less intimidating and overwhelming for the owners when the dog is coming home. Yeah, of And course. that's something, you know, I didn't do that my first couple of years, not only because I probably just didn't have the time or um, the resources, but you know, I've noticed a big shift in my board and train clients specifically when I brought the ebook into the picture yep. because it gives them kind of this starting point to where they don't feel like, you know, often I'll tell my clients, your dog is coming home smarter than you. Mm-hmm. I have to catch you up to their speed oh, because yeah. their skill sets up here and yours is down here. Mm-hmm. And so this ebook has kind of helped bring the owners up a little bit to where they have the confidence that when they do take that leash or they do take that remote, that they are familiar or at least understanding of 
what we're going to be doing and how to apply these things. But it's also something that they have to look back on. And I think that alone, because like you said, like these owners aren't confident going into it. Mm -hmm. And we really have to find what's going to motivate them and and boost that confidence. And for a lot of people, it'll, it'll be little easy things. But for some people, you really have to do a lot of problem solving and figure out kind of the root of why are you feeling this way? What is it that's stopping you from wanting to better your dog and better yourself like because at this point it's not even the dog's quality of life that's lacking it's now the owners yep because it the dog is stressing them out that much you know i have so many owners that are like i don't leave my house because my dog is a wreck without me oh yeah and it's like that is not healthy Mm -hmm. it's not healthy (laughs) yeah for anybody i mean i mean yeah some people just have their lives so inhibited by their dog Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah a hundred percent well, listen, uh, obviously I'm not one to, to in any sort of position to be like, you know, like, uh, like, like here's all this advice or anything, but I've, I've, uh, I've, I've had, my, I've worked for myself, had my own company now since 2015. And I feel like I've experienced just about every fucking bullshit, shitty <laughs> experience you could ever experience as a, mm-hmm. uh, an owner of a business, let alone an owner of a dog training business. And one light at the end of the tunnel, I think in your case right now, like, cause I know you're, like you said, you get, you got some things that you're kind of dealing with every single time I've ever run into one of those like really massive setbacks or, or, or feelings like that. There's always some sort of phenomenal like adjustment or business growth or something like that. That's going to come from it, you know? So yeah. I, and I mean, I've definitely <clears throat> learned a lot, like I said, yeah. from my employee leaving. So like everyone keeps asking, when are you going to rehire? Are you yeah. going to rehire? Are you looking for employees? And it's like, Yes, but I am getting some shit organized yeah. that I did not have before. A hundred percent. So yeah, so that's a big thing. Um, question though for you, with yeah. you saying that, I'm curious. Have you ever had a dog die that you've had, like a training dog die on you? Sure, you've had it. Yep, two Same. times. Two times before. Um, so first time was just old age. It was a dog boarding with us. Uh, it was a really old dog. Um, the owners kind of knew, you know, that it was, it was coming and it was a contingency plan. The, the second one was we had a, I don't even remember. It was like a shepherd mix that came in for a boarding train, uh, actually from, came up from the Columbus area. And, um, we, the dog was in our care for maybe two days. Right. Um, it was just clearly very stressed out. Right. We, hadn't even really got too into any sort of training at that point because it was with us for such a short period of time. And um, the dog was just stressed, wouldn't stop panting, wouldn't stop panting. Day two, we rushed the dog up to the to the vet because it's like something's wrong with this dog. We were in contact mm-hmm. with the owner. And uh, as soon as the dog got to the vet, it pretty much passed away right away. Um, and we wound up actually getting, because we had no idea what was like what right. caused it or what happened. Yeah, we did a, a necropsy uh, over at OSU. Turns out the dog had some sort of pre-existing like brain condition that caused its brain to like overheat like extremely intensely. And it was just wrong place, wrong time. And uh, yeah. That so sucks. yeah, been there. <laughs> yeah, I experienced that for the first time last March and yeah. it was fucking terrible yeah but mm-hmm. you know family i mean the family it was with yeah. super close family been working with them for like five years sure. and golden retriever overweight mm-hmm. but you know that breeds prone to heart conditions now this dog didn't have any pre-existing heart conditions that we knew of at its last vet check mm-hmm. um but we went took the dog out off leash we always took this dog out off leash with our pack is nothing new yeah and got her out of the car, literally released her and she just collapsed while she was running in the field. Yeah. And so I thought, cause I was letting the other dogs out of the car at the time. She was one of the first dogs that got out. By the time I turned my back, you know, this is maybe five seconds after I let her, mm-hmm. she's, you know, on her side. And I thought she was like rolling in the grass in the sun. Yeah. So I called her to me and this is a dog that has like a quick recall. As soon as you say its name, it's on. And she didn't respond. And so I tapped the e-collar. She didn't respond. So I sprinted over there and she was already eyes open, tongue out, yeah. gone. And I was just like, <clears throat> so 
what the fuck? So it's interesting, right? Because, you know, to a lot of people listening to this, they're going to think like, that's so crazy. Like, how could that happen or whatever? This stuff happens more than people think. And when you deal like, so in our case, like we have anywhere from like, like 250 to 400 dogs in our care every year, right? Like we work with a lot of dogs, right? Whether it's boarding, whether it's boarding trains, whether it's one-on-ones. And if you're in this industry for a long time, like you're going to experience that eventually because freak things Mm -hmm. happen, right? Freak things completely out of your control. Past just our care, right? I could think of so many situations where I've had clients call me at 6.30, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the night, like, hey, something's funny with my dog. They kind of stopped walking, and I don't know what's going on. They rush the dog up to the emergency vet, and then the dog dies within a couple hours of that, right? Some sort of freak thing happens, right? So um, I I think, you know, as a new trainer, if you're going to be doing board and trains and stuff like that, you do need to prepare yourself for you know, inevitably, if and when something like that happens and not let it crush you. Because I remember the first time it happened, the first time was actually with that that shepherd, right? So it was an even weirder situation. It wasn't just an old age thing. And I remember when I needed to make the phone call to the owner about it, that was like the single most, I remember sitting there shaking with my phone, like with the number typed in, ready to hit send. And I probably sat Mm -hmm. there for three minutes ready to hit that button right before I actually did it because I was so I didn't I I never in a million years could have fathomed that happening right right and then tack on to it not knowing uh what happened or anything like that we actually uh, thinking about it we had I mean since we're getting fucking deep with this one we actually had we had we actually had one more that I remembered that happened just two years ago maybe um that was a similar situation it was a dog that we had worked with extensively the dog did a board and train with us like years before we did so many follow-up lessons and stuff amazing clients, right? We had such a great relationship with them. And the dog was just doing its routine board with us. The board dog boards with us like like two times a year or something like that. And I think the dog was in our care for two days. And uh, we went to go let the dog out for its midday run. And it was just unresponsive in its kennel. Uh, and same deal, rushed the dog up to the vet. Even the vet came out. He's like, there's probably nothing that you could have done, right? It probably was some sort of just freak thing like that. Um, you know, unfortunately, again, to, to trainers, like stuff like that can happen, you know, and it's extremely yeah. scary. But, I remember like it was the yeah. shittiest situation too, because I was by myself with, I had four other dogs off yeah. leash. So we have five dogs off leash. Now this dog's dead limp in the middle of a field. Yeah. I have to pick her up, mm-hmm. carry her back to the car with the other dogs. I've got to get back, Yeah, you know, and at this point I had already called the owner, but you know. And she was already gone. There was nothing you could do. So, of course, all the dogs in the car are, like, sniffing all over her. And I'm like, get the fuck off this dog. You know, like. Yeah, yeah. And so she was just on a cot. And in the car, I dropped the other dogs off at the house, took her to the emergency vet, which, of course, they came out and checked her. And I was like, no, like, you don't need to check her. Like, she's gone. But they were like, it's just protocol. And so I asked the family, do do we want to do a necropsy? And they said, no, like she's gone. There's, there's, it doesn't matter how she went. Like she's gone. There's nothing we can do. Don't, don't worry about it. Well, the fucking crazy thing was they had had a golden retriever that passed away the same exact way before this dog. Interesting. Right. And so I was like, are you kidding me? And they said, no, like we were out in our front yard throwing the ball and she was, or he was, it was a girl. Wait, no, I think the first one was a boy, but anyway, they're both golden retrievers. And different breeders, because I asked that immediately. I was like, did you get it from the same breeder? And they said, no, this came from a different breeder. And they were throwing the ball, and the dog just collapsed. Now, that dog didn't die on the spot. They said it was alive until they got it to the emergency vet, and then it passed away there. Yeah. Um, And that one was um, its heart. Yep. Its heart stopped. But this one, they thought because of how quickly she died – that it could have been a brain aneurysm, Mm -hmm. but they said either way, it was probably her heart or her brain and there's nothing you can do, Yeah, you know? And I was just like, that is just some shit luck. Yeah. I had a client with the ball situation happened before. Um, They had a dog. This is their dog before the one that I trained. So they were telling me the story of they had this dog and the dog was only like six months old or something like that. And same deal. They're in the park playing ball and the dog just collapsed while playing ball. So again, further saying like as as unfortunate as these circumstances are, unfortunately, like you said, you know, shit happens sometimes and it's, it's terrible and it's scary, but like, man, like 
yeah, you definitely got to like, you got to prepare yourself for the inevitables of things like that, that, that can and, and probably will happen at some point in your career in this. Yeah. So. And they, I mean, eventually ended up getting yet another golden retriever. Yeah. Surprisingly from the same breeder. And they had asked that breeder, has this happened to anyone, like any sure. of your other dogs? And he was like, no, like never had this happen. Yeah. Um, and so they retired, you know, the dog that she came from just in case, sure. but then they, they fast forward ha- now have another golden puppy that I've already done the puppy boarding training and the e-collar training. And, you know, yeah. they're, they're a family that often boards with me. Like, you know, yeah. I think actually that dog comes in next week. Um, yeah. but you know, they go on trips often. I board their dogs probably once mm-hmm. every three months easily, like yeah. quarterly throughout the year. And, and that just, but they that's great just family. A, t- a testament to, to your relationship with your clients is everything. Cause the same deal. The last one I said has had another dog since that they've brought to training as well. Right. Um, and you know, it, your intentions are all that matter in this, right? And as long as you're doing the right thing and as long as you have good intentions and you truly care about the dogs you're working with, you know, people are going to be understanding in those situations, right? Yeah, <clears throat> they were. I mean, making that call, of course, it was awful. Yeah. And, you know, you just hear them on the other side of the phone panicking and crying and mm-hmm. and I was crying and it was just, it was heartbreaking. But yes, my relationship with that family was already strong yeah. and I feel like this made it even stronger. Sure. They had three little boys, which I'm so, I told them, I'm so glad that the boys did not have to witness that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, of course the boys were very sad and upset and they didn't really understand because they were younger. Um, but, you know, after a couple of months when the shock had kind of worn off, they were starting to ask, you know, when are we going to get another dog? And yeah. the oldest son that did understand was like, I don't ever want another dog again. They just die. Yeah. You know, and Jeez. it was like, fuck. Yeah, right. <laughs> but they eventually, you know, came around and, and now have this dog. Um, gosh, she's probably got to be nine months by now, 10 months, almost a year. Yeah. Um, sweet, sweet, another golden. But yeah, this family is, just, I mean, it could, I don't want to say I couldn't have asked for a better situation for that shitty situation, but this sure. family yeah, yeah, was just, yeah, it was, they're just great. Yeah. Definitely a special bond with them for sure. Most certainly. Well, listen, Megan, I, like I said, I really appreciate coming on. It's been a good conversation. Um, why don't you, what, what do you, where do you want people to check you out? I know you have your ebook and stuff. I don't know if that's for sale or just available or uh, my ebook is just available to my clients. It's just a part of my board and train program. I do, I do offer it to, uh, some of my private lesson clients that are using the tools like the prong collars and the e-collars and have more reactive, severe case dogs. Sure. Um, but it's not something I put for sale yet. I've been thinking about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but my Instagram page, that's where I'm most active. I cannot get down with the TikTok shit. So many people try and get me on it. And I'm just like, nope, I'm not going to do it. It's a mess. Um, <laughs> Facebook is up there, but it's not my, it's really my Instagram just feeds to Facebook. Really, I'm just Instagram, um, Instagram and email. It's really about it. I like it. <laughs> Keep well, it simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, listen, like I said, I really appreciate it. We'll have to we'll have to hop on again soon. If you're ever in the uh, in the Ohio area, hit me up. Yeah, I'll be in Ohio for in June for a wedding. So maybe we can coordinate something before or after the wedding, and I can come up to Cleveland because yeah. I'll be in the Cincinnati area. But yeah, yeah, yeah. if I'm gonna be in Ohio, I'm gonna want to make my rounds. Hell yeah, would love to would love to see it. So yeah, I'd love to come check your facility out for sure. Awesome. All right. But yeah, this has been great. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's been awesome. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk to you soon and we'll let you know when everything goes uh, goes up. All right. Sounds good. Have a good day, y'all. Yep. Take care. Thanks.